and welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maokwe Ogun Yusuf. When the new week began, a lot of Nigerians had anticipated that perhaps what we might deal with on the news this week will be the fallout of the convention of the All Progressives Congress, which happened on Saturday and went on into the wee hours of Sunday. None anticipated the attack on the Kaduna International Airport on that same Sunday or the tragedy which befell all of us with the attacks on a Kaduna-bound train which saw at least eight passengers lose their lives, 26 injured and many more unaccounted for with fears that they have been kidnapped. The entire nation has been grappling with the aftermath of these depressing events. But the lead question for us tonight is, if politics and political organizations exist to solve problems, how well can the All Progressives Congress claim to have solved the problems bedeviling the country since it took national power in 2015? My guest tonight is a member of the Board of Trustees of the All Progressives Congress and former national youth leader, Barista Ismail Ahmed. Ismail Ahmed, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you very much for having me, Malcolm. It's a pretty somber time for all of us. It is. Um, coming from the euphoria which your party had tried to pass across at the end of the convention. Now, for some people, it underscores the challenges which confront political parties after the 2023 elections. Uh, do parties understand currently, are they aware of the challenges which they face even as a jostle for positions? Or are they too consumed by the jostling within their political parties to be aware of this? Well, I think parties are aware. Well, I think my party is absolutely aware. I can't speak for other political parties. But I think um, parties do exist primarily to create platforms and uh, policy beds for, for people in governance who are members of that party so that you could drive in solving uh, national developmental problems or issues and um, uh, I think so it, it, my political party the APC is quite aware uh, of what's going on and uh, what we campaigned for in 2014 2015 why we got elected uh, and uh, how we have been able to channel some of the meager resources that we found when we came into office into infrastructural development and uh, human capital development and try to see how we can reduce poverty and uh, how we'll be able to move the country from point A to point B in terms of progress, you know, in, you know, in the entirety of the national life. Uh, I think so, so we're uniquely aware of that. Uh, whether or not sometimes uh, it comes across to the general public uh, that uh, there is this synergy uh, between political parties and people in government, whether even people who hold political offices in government are quite aware of what the party promised, what the manifesto of the party is. If there's that, that fusion, that synergy, sometimes it gets lost. Sometimes people get confused whether there's that as well. Uh, and in my 22 months in, in, in the helms of party affairs, I've come to realize that, um, you know, sometimes we, we, need to we need to remind people who are holding political offices that, look, hey, you know, you're not here on your own, you know. Some people just allude to the fact that, oh, I got appointed through ABC and uh, he was a person that recommended me. No, there is a manifesto that a political party campaigned on. That's a promise, you know, and that promise is what is supposed to be translated into governance. And so that a person who is in the party and a person who is in the, gov in the government should be able to answer the same question because they are all peeling it off from the same script. So I think that sometimes get lost uh, to the general public, but I think political parties uh, are uniquely aware of that, of that fact. You've had the privilege of holding both offices. I mean, you served as a political appointee. Mm -hmm. You've also served in political party leadership. Um, how well would you say that in serving as um, you know, a political leader within your political organization, you have had, I don't know if you've ever had cause to call attention uh, perhaps of political people holding political offices uh, to the manifesto of your party, perhaps to draw them back in line. Yeah, I have I have had uh, cause to do that. What I had done when I was a youth leader is first of all call almost all the young people below a certain age uh, who are political appointees to have a meeting with them and say, hey, you know, yeah, 
you are members of a political party first and foremost. You know, you need to come to the political party. Do you know what our manifesto said? Do you even have our manifesto? Do you have our constitution? Do you know what is expected of you? Do you have the guidelines that we expect you to behave, the decorum, the decency, code of what it is to be a progressive? Because to me personally, being a progressive member of the APC should be more than wearing a flag pin or putting the flag in your car or behind your seat when you hold executive positions. It has to be an ideology. What you made know. you do that? Did you see something going wrong? Yeah, yes, I just I found out, you know, that uh, there, there are a lot of people that have a complete disconnect between the political people. There are so many people holding political offices that have never been to the to the party office. They don't they don't they don't even know what our manifesto is. They were not part of the of the of the campaign in 2015. They do not understand what we campaign on. So yeah, okay, maybe they're technocrats, maybe they're good at what they do, maybe they got elected, that's fine, they got appointed, that's fine, that's okay, you know. But once you get elected into a government that is serving a political purpose, you know, it has a promise that it has made to an electorate, then the first thing I think you should do without being prompted is to find out, hey, what was the promise, what was the general promise? And then we had a conversation with some of um, uh, members of National Assembly, for example, and uh, we have the majority in National Assembly, and we have a majority of people holding political offices in the executive side. And then yet, we come for, uh, for budget defense, for example, you know, before the annual budget goes in. And the expectations of the legislators who are, you know, for maybe for all intents and purposes, maybe members of APC, uh, you know, the question and answers, the, the the back and forth between them and the people or the ministers or the heads of MDAs, you know, you could tell that, hey, maybe these people are not re reading from the same script. So I asked, you know, one, one of our leadership uh, meetings, I said, hey, there's no reason why we should go for any budget defense or budget uh, cycle before it gets passed by National Assembly if both of our party members are not in sync with exactly what the expectation is because the manifesto of the party broke down every sector what is expected for APC to do, what we promise APC to do, what we promise the country that APC is going to do. So it is only fair that if Maupe, for example, is a distinguished senator who is on the platform of APC, she should know what that expectations are. If Ismail Ahmed, who happens to be maybe, for example, a minister, or ahead of an MDA who is coming before Mopay Ogun to defend his budget, and he is also a member of APC, he should know that expectation. So the conversation should have been a lot more seamless, should have been on the platform of a script that was pulled off from the manifesto. And I realized that there are in some cases where there is absolutely disconnect from that. And so, so I went around and asked, there are so many people that simply do not understand. The example, what our manifesto is. That example might be a very tricky one because I know that even members of the National Assembly have argued that when they are elected as members of the National as members of the National Assembly, at some point they'll have to set the party aside because of the demands of their position or of their offices as members of the legislature, and which also demands that they you know, hold the executive arm of government accountable. Uh, for you, how do you see that members no. of the National Assembly reconcile that part, which, recognize, which you know, demands that they scrutinize um, on behalf of the Nigerian people yes. uh, the proposals that have been brought before them by the executive arm of government? Oh, no, absolutely. Oh, it hasn't, this, what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. has absolutely nothing to do with what you're talking In fact, it encourages them to do so. So, for example, if I'm a member of National Assembly and I'm a member of APC, I'm not saying that APC trumps what... No, 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 no. What I'm saying is that the manifesto that APC sold to Nigerian public and Nigerian electorate to get elected in the first place is a contract between APC and the Nigerian public. So it is expected that members of the party who are holding elective positions in National Assembly should defend that manifesto, should be able to see that members of the executive who are mainly maybe technocrats, implement those promises. Those are already promises between us and the Nigerian public. So there's nothing wrong. So it encourages them to hold members of the executive to account based on a script that has been promised to the Nigerian public, that has been agreed on, that we were elected on. 
So I think it just makes their job easier instead of just random questions of personal beliefs. Take it from a script of a platform belief of a political party that made a promise to a country. Mm. So it makes your job easier. It makes it more direct. It makes it more accountable. And it just makes a whole lot of sense. Well, it's examination time now. We're nearing the examination time. And uh, the APC is going to be like every, unlike every other party in the coming elections. Why? Because it was in opposition. It criticized the sitting government to be able to take power. Not many political parties have had that privilege. And they're going to be asking questions as to, you know, what it has promised and what it has delivered. Now, how well do you think that the APC can hold up its result shit against the manifesto which it promised, especially in the area of security? When you look, I mean, today we're talking about uh, a real line which was bombed, which we've spent a, a lot of money on, but we've now lost lives and also lost, you know, a national asset which we'll have to repair as a result of lapses in security. Well, you know, I don't want to, I'm not a security expert. I try to say that all the time. I don't know what, uh, I don't have intel of what's going on. And uh, all I know is that I can see effort being made by service chiefs or intelligence chiefs in response to a demand or or directive of the commander-in-chief to nip certain things in the bud. But what happened, it's a, uh, it's heartbreaking. And uh, I have people that I know personally because that have, um, are said to have gone missing, they've still not been found, as I speak to you. Um, these are people who are personally very close to me. These are not people I know, these are not acquaintances, these are people that I know very well, that I speak to almost on a weekly basis. Uh, so it's a tragedy too close to home. Uh, the Kaduna bound train is a train that people who are my family, my, my friends, everybody I know, being from Kano, uh, I know from that axis of Kano, Kaduna, Katsana and the rest. And, uh, so this, uh, this, this is the usual mode of transport on a daily basis. Could have been me, could have been my family, because that's, that's what we take every day. The roads, uh, so, so, so it's, it's a, a tragedy of immense personal proportion to me. And um, I'm not usually a person who jumps quickly to try to blame certain things. And I always like to find out what happened, what could have gone wrong. Do we see this coming? What was it? How could we prevent it? Now, insecurity generally, all over the world, it's something that every country is almost grappling with, for one form or another. Some deal with terrorists, some deal with insurgents within, some deal with, with, with casual crime that goes on a daily basis, some deal with police brutality that kills people so there's all kinds of insecurity. Some deal with drug crimes. What, what but but what, what I'm saying is, yeah. I don't have the intel, I don't have the information. All I know is that all of us are angry. Um, I know the president is. Um, I know that uh, uh, I just, because of how personally involved I am in this, I don't, I don't even want to talk about it. So I, just, I just hope that we get to the bottom of it real quick. We rescue the people who have been abducted. Um, and uh, we put measures in place for this never, ever, ever to happen again. And that's usually our hope. 
and our prayer. Uh, but sadly, you know, I really have to, con I, I don't want to say condolences because I want to hope that the people who have been affected and whom we are still expecting back home will be returned safely home. But condolences to all of us who have now lost, you know, fellow citizens right. as a result of this tragedy. Absolutely. Um, but this is one in a long string. Um, should we talk about Niger State, for instance, where children were abducted um, in secondary schools, in, a, in an Islamia school, well, even small children uh, were taken? Should we talk about Zamfara, where young people were taken? Should we talk about Kaduna? So it's a long, long list of tragedies which have befallen us as a people. And they come despite the promises of your party, you're going to, 2023 is going to come. The chances are very high that you will be campaigning very loudly for your party based on the achievements. When it comes to security, will you be able to still say that your party has done well given the promise that it made to Nigerians in 2015 and 2019? No matter the improvement, we have made a lot of improvements in security. That I can sh I can assure you, because in terms of uh, in terms of equipment, in terms of uh, boosting morale of security agencies, in terms of direct intervention, uh, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, uh, of stability of the military, and making sure on the on other security agencies and giving them all, creating all kinds of of executive orders and, 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 and legislations to be able to help them boost whatever it is. Because the first thing any commander in chief would do naturally when he comes into office uh, and there is security challenges to find out, okay, hey, what's been going on? What are the issues? You know, he would have to ask the experts on the field. It is based on the response that he gets from the experts on the field that he'll go out and try to tick all the boxes and make sure that he solves all the problems. If after done, been doing, doing all that, you know, funding is our problem, okay, we have funding here. We have security trust fund for the police. We have a lot of funding going into the military. What, are, what other issues do you have? We, have? we don't have equipment, okay. You know, everybody attested the fact that there are a lot of equipment that have come into the hands of the military in the last seven years. Okay, fine, so what else is your problem? We don't have the manpower, okay. You have the, you have, we can lift the embargo. Even though the country is dealing with meager resources, it will allow the police to to recruit 10,000 people, you know, the, the military should be able to go and recruit more people. We should be able to devolve community policing at the community level. What else? They will tell him he has ticked all the boxes that they have asked him to tick, and yet we still have this issue. So now the problem is, okay, what are the major problems? Okay, we have problems with uh, sharing of intelligence, for example. Uh, this side do not want to share intelligence with this side. There's a turf war uh, between the agencies. There's this and that. I'm just giving an example. Okay, so that we need to do to be able to coordinate to make sure that there, are, there is, you know, synergy and fusion between uh, intelligence, between uh, security agencies, so that we'll be able to deal with these problems. What else is the problem? Some will tell you that, okay, the problem is not boots on the ground. The problem is not the manpower we lack. It's a holistic problem of a village, for example, who, who have young people, you know, that barely make 5,000 naira in a month or 10,000 naira in a month. And then they become informants of people who pass by or people who visit to local bandits and then they get 100,000 or 200,000 from this local band if there is ransom paid. They will not stop easily because that's a windfall. And then you're dealing with the local person who used to sell his cow once in a month and get what, two, three hundred thousand naira. That would be able to, that, that would be what he would be able to survive on. And then now he can abduct someone, a neighbor's son, for example, under the connivance with the neighbor's children because trust has broken down in the local family values that we used to have has broken down. And then all you can whisper to him that there's a neighbor's son, his, uh, his son, his older son he used to work in Abuja. He works in uh, uh, one of the agencies that makes a lot of money. He comes once in two months and he brings a lot of money to children. If you kidnap the youngest daughter, you get money. Neighbors, 
famous. And then they get abducted. And then the young man working in Abuja, who feeds his family, would have to send uh, two or three million naira, getting everybody uh, involved to be able to raise that kind of money to settle to have his younger sister released. Those kind of trust and values have broken down seriously. And that is the next phase of how do we deal with a trust within a family value and a community level that has broken down. This magnetism of materialism that has metastasized in every shape and form in local communities that before used to be contented with few things, but now age and technology and so many things have brought it so closer that they wanted the larger and the bigger life of the cities that they see on a daily basis. That they are no longer contented with going to farm and be able to make 10,000 naira. They want to make 1 million naira now. And now the easiest way to do it is through banditry or giving information for people to be kidnapped. The next question is how do we deal with that? And that is the phase now that I think is the most difficult because it is not only boots on the ground, it is not soldiers, it is not guns. It is a community problem. Well, you were talking about the complexities which you will now have to deal with when we are addressing security. A lot of it, some people will say, is chickens coming home to roost. That people for too long have looked on at how the political class have run their, their affairs on their behalf. And it will seem that now they're about to start taking the little pound of flesh. That inference you made between Abuja and the rural areas, uh, where it was seen that the rural areas have been places that have been largely neglected and the cities have been places where if you had the right connect uh, you could be living a life that you never thought you could live um, and you know for many years that neglect has continued but it will look like these people are now out to get their pound of flesh back do you think that the political class realized that this could also be the problem and uh, do you think that they're finding ways, if they think it is a problem, uh, to also reflect that maybe not all the glitters is truly gold? Well, first of all, let me make a clarification. I'm not saying that that is the problem. I'm just saying that from my perspective, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that the government has done or is doing all it can to make sure that it equip the security agencies to deal with this. But that's the hard part of it. You know, that's the hard war. This is a soft war. This is a soft battle. And that's what I was alluding to. Indeed. That is, that this, is, this is the soft part of it. It's not something that you could do by, by equipping military people or by sending troops more and stuff like that. Um, it's something that is a bit more holistic that has to go. Um, and I think that's the phase that government... Uh, at all levels, not only the federal government, because there's a lot of there seems to be a lot of concentration on the national government. Oh yes, indeed. Uh, when I made reference, uh, but, to but let me let me just yeah. finish this. Uh, but but governments at all levels, you know, some would tell you easily that uh, the lack of presence of local government at uh, the third tier of government is largely responsible for this, and you would some would blame state governors for basically terminating the local government administrations because they just move on. I think until recently, either it's a Supreme Court judgment, or I think there was a new law that says that you, know, you can't just keep suspending indefinitely local government elections at whims and caprices until you want to do it. Uh, and I think the president, this president has made it clear from the beginning, you, know, you need to have effective local government administration because it is at that level that anything can begin to be nipped at the board. You know, because you can't just say that every little problem you have at every ward has to go all the way to Abuja. You know, we simply do not have either the time, the resources, or the manpower to be able to deal with it. And that is why there are three levels of government. So some would argue that. But back to your question about neglect of the rural areas or, or the over-concentration of, of the cities, I think it's not... Uh, not just over-concentration. It's, it's not neglect, per but, se. But, but, the, but the ostentation 
of the political class. I think I don't vis -a -vis think. Vis-a-vis what we see in the rural area. I think. I think you see. I think there's a mistake. I don't think it's the ostentation of the political class that drives this. Not necessarily, because most often than not, the victims of these tragedies are not political. Are not politically exposed people that you think. You know, it doesn't matter. I gave you an example of somebody who is a public who is a who, who may who may or may not be just a civil servant here in Abuja. A civil servant who works who works in Channels TV. Not a civil servant who works in Channels TV who comes to Abuja or who goes to Lagos and he has been able to save a few money to take back to his family. Well, the what I'm saying is that if there is anyone, anyone with a semblance, semblance of living you know, and be able to cater for his family, either his parents or his direct family. You know, and they live in an area where, you know, this trust value system has broken down. Let me tell you what used to be, or what is, to a large extent, still obtainable in some parts of the North. And this is a funny conversation. It might be something that I had with, with, with someone. Someone told me that, you know, he's an Easterner who had a conversation with me and um, and he asked me where I was from. I told him I was from Kano. He said, oh, you know, I, I, I have stayed in Kano. I love Kano people. I think, I think um, you know, you guys are very trustworthy people. And I asked him why he said that. He said, well, it's only in the north that you would come. For example, you are driving on the street and then your fuel finish, for example, in your car. And then you would... Uh, look like you're stranded. And then the first young man you see, or young boy you would see, who is probably even begging for money. You know, you would call him, even a thousand naira or ten thousand naira to go and get you the fuel in the next filling station. He would climb on the bike. He doesn't know you, you don't know him. He's begging for money. Maybe he's looking for a thousand bucks to eat. You give him five thousand naira or ten thousand naira. He would get on the bike, go get you the fuel bring it back to you, give you a fuel and give you a change if there is any. He said it has happened to him more than two or three times. Or he would go to a local market where people sell, you know, food stuff. And then there was a man who even changes, who, who, does, who deals with the change. He will, he will come and park your car, he will bring out his dollars, you say you want a change for $300 for example, he would give you the $300 while you are sitting in your car before he takes the naira from you. And he said you can go home and be rest assured that that dollar is not fake. He said that's also people. Those kind of trust value system that we are known for in the villages everywhere used to be contented. But now there is a, like I said, a magnetism to a materialism that has been brought about by I don't know what, that now has broken it down to a level where people are greedy enough to hurt other people, to be able to attain a position that is ferric as, at best, and that also contributes to a complete, complete breakdown of security and order. Let me go back to your party manifesto. Um, the vice president had a uh, pretty fine speech at the convention talking about how the APC, um, you know, took a vow, took a creed uh, to secure, to, you know, enthrone the welfare of the people, welfare and security and happiness of the people um, at the forefront of its manifesto. And he said that the president summarized these aspirations in three simple words, security, the economy and fighting corruption. A few days ago, however, let me say two weeks ago more precisely, a businessman and billionaire, Tony Ilumelu, tweeted. He said, this morning, I'm listening to my colleagues at the office bemoan the very pressing issues that they face every day in this country and how things have been getting worse and worse. No electricity for five days, hikes in the price of diesel, frightening food inflation, etc. How can a country so rich in natural resources have 90% of its citizens living in hardship and poverty. Um, he talks about how electricity is critical for development, alleviation of poverty, 
Um, and he says, speaking of security, our people are afraid. Businesses are suffering. How can we be losing over 95% of oil production to thieves? Look at the Bonnie terminal that should be receiving over 200,000 barrels of crude daily. Instead, they received less than 3,000 barrels, leading the operator, Shell, to declare force majeure. It was against this backdrop. I mean, you are very aware of the energy crisis, which looks like it's tapering down a bit um, because it, the queues seem to be diminishing bit by bit. However, it was against this backdrop that the APC held its convention. Can you really say that your party has delivered the greatest good to the greatest number? Okay, so. We are in a very difficult circumstances, globally. We are not uh, an island on our own. Our economy is inextricably linked with the rest of the economies of the world. Inflation has been going up in almost every country in the world, including the United States and Europe. No country in this world as we speak today has been able to manage its inflation very well or its food prices very well. S let me finish. Oh yes, no, I will no, no, let no. you we finish. We cannot we cannot be isolated uh, now. Uh, no, no, the reason why it's in the important. last 7 years, hold so, on. No, in the, the last the, 7 the years, what about the energy crisis? Isolate. Let me let me finish this. In, in the, the last the, 7 the, years, the reason why it's important to isolate. Marpe, you have to let me finish this point I'm, before I'm you. I'm going to let you finish the point. Because you are going to disrupt my train of thought and I would come back to your question not being able to syndicate my answers very well. We don't have a lot of time. That's why it is important. Exactly, that's the more reason why you should allow me finish my question. Okay. Go ahead. You packed on the questions for me and you want me to summarize No, no, the no, no, no. It's important. <laughs> I, I, what I want you to do, okay. I mean, is address something. Yes, I am aware. I'm very aware, and I'm sure that a lot of our viewers are aware of... And you know, Mr. Tony Alumelu should also be especially aware. aware. But let me tell you why it is important. The most important part of this tweet for me is businesses are suffering. How can we be losing 95% of oil production to thieves? If the whole world is suffering, Nigeria should not be one of the countries suffering at a time when oil prices at well over a hundred dollars per barrel. It's not as there, if as it's not as if they turn out that. to be under hold on. Hold on. Since we got into office, this is the first time. This is since we got into office in 2015. This is the first time that oil is hitting up to 80, 90, 100 dollars a barrel. And this, hold on. And this happened like a month ago. Why did it happen? Because of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Now, this is oil business. I'm not a businessman. I do not understand these economies, but I do know something for a fact, and I'm sure you do too, as a journalist, that you don't sell oil today and get the money tomorrow. That's not the way it happens. These things wait up and there's a tiring time before it comes along. So even if you say that the, the prices have gone up, Brent could have gone up in the, in the indexes in New York Stock Exchange or whatever exchange that you look at, it's not as if the Nigeria has started getting the $109 a barrel today it or yesterday. The theft. Now, no, hold on. This theft has been going on for, I don't know his statistics of saying 95% of the oil is being stolen. I don't think that is true, even though I do not know for a fact. But I'm not going to take Mr. Lumelu. Melu, I know for a fact. And that what 95% we know, so we're not, of our production we, is being stolen. We, haven't, is we stolen. haven't heard from That what? That we, we, we sell, we, we, we haven't what? Heard that from we earn the, only 5%? The NNPC should actually. And we are doing this well with the 5% that we have been earning only? Just a moment. So we're the, building all this infrastructure with the 5%? Thought, what one would have thought is now that maybe perhaps we are genius. the NNPC or perhaps the Minister of State for Petroleum might have responded to this tweet because when someone then like, maybe, just maybe moment, that question maybe, should have been to him. So, so uh, what is surprising is that they ha are yet to respond. But what we did see was the Minister for Petroleum, Minister of State for Petroleum Resources. Mm. We saw the Chief of Defense Staff and we saw the GMD of NNPC visit the Niger Delta over oil theft. It has gotten to the point where they've had to set up a special committee. No this one is, is arguing. Is no one is arguing the that since the, the Obasanjo. No, hold on. No one is arguing that reached, since the military junta. proportions. No one is arguing that since the military junta, since the military junta, since before the re-advent of democracy in 1999, that there has no, there has not been oil theft in the Niger Delta. I'm not arguing against that. 
And like I told you, I'm not in the oil and gas business. I'm not in the oil and gas industry. I don't hold a portfolio for it. I don't know what the statistics are. But I do know for a fact that there is no way in this world common sense would tell me that 95% of our production is being stolen. And if, even if that is the case, if 95%, which means we are selling only, the country is only earning 5%, and we are still do, building these infrastructures with it, then maybe we're a genius. We're borrowing. Maybe. You know, we as well as we Every do, country that in the we're world borrows. Heavily. And every we're not, country in the world we borrows. We know that. But we're borrowing. What are we saying? To subsidize. Every, to subsidize what? To subsidize consumption. We're Every in the country. In no, we are to, I'm talking about infrastructure now. I'm talking about the second Niger Bridge. I'm talking about the Kano Abuja, uh, sorry, the uh, Kano Kaduna Abuja Road. I'm talking You're about not almost 35. Of how much hold on. We're borrowing to pay subsidies? No, no, hold on. I'm not talking about subsidies now. I'm talking about the hard infrastructures that we're doing. Where are we getting the funds from? 35,000 kilometers of road. In seven years that we're about to complete, that's a, where are we getting the, the funding from? The question I pose to you um, now: Sire, the answer I'm giving you, the answer I'm the giving you, the for consumption, no, 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 the bleeding we, no, we're experiencing hold on. in the Niger Delta. Now, if we're bleeding in Niger Delta, government should do all it can to stop it. That's government's responsibility. I'm not going to shield government away from that. It can't shield itself away from that. If there's going to, if there's five percent of theft of our national uh, national uh, revenue, like the oil and gas, government should stop at nothing to stop it. If it can't stop it, government should have itself to blame. That is absolutely true. I don't have any issues with that. But what I'm saying is, do not bring statistics of saying that this country is borrowing as if no any other country borrows, or this country is, uh, after all the infrastructure that we're laying on the floor, after all the rail lines that you talked about, national assets that we're doing, no country in this world survives without borrowing. No country is self-contained. And then you I, have I people, think, and then you I have people, important to and you have people that should know more, who call themselves businessmen, who thrive in this country, who made it, in this same country that they like to put down at every opportunity that they have to say that, that it is okay that this country, everything is failing, as if they are not doing well with their businesses in the same country they like to put down every time because they have access to tweet or because they have megaphones because they are billionaires. Mm. Well, I do know, and I'm not holding brief for uh, Mr. Tony Lumelu, but I do know that he's not one of those who tweets, you know, constantly or frequently about state failure. I don't think anybody likes to do that. And I heard uh, but, he's one of the people but, that bought one of the gas stations for the energy crisis that we're in, anyways. If people have questions, and if they are showing, expressing concern... And they should be answered. Uh, you don't think... Exactly. And you should be answered. Uh, so there are questions as to how come... No, 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 that's not a question. When you say 95%... Oh, no, when you say 95%... An instance. He said when of you Shell, said no. Shell when is you not said ninety five percent company. Hold on. When you say ninety five percent of the oil yes. production is being stolen, that's not a question. That's a statement. It is a statement. You, you don't think that... And it, I disagree with him. I don't have the right to disagree with him. But you just acknowledge that you do not have the figures to be able to dispute those Yeah, figures. he doesn't either. He cannot tell me that 95% of not. our production even, is even, stolen. Even I totally disagree with it. He certainly is in a position, as we all are, to know that Shell has declared a force majeure. That is not something that is done in secret. It doesn't need to a take 95% for Shell, for Shell a, to do a, that. A company doesn't need to do that if, if everything was All okay. the major oil companies have been trying to run away from fossil fuel in the last 10 years. We all know that. That's not what makes a company declare force majeure. I don't know what makes, makes the company declare force majeure. Well, all me, I know is that it cannot be 95% of our oil production is being stolen. Let me bring I disagree you, with that. I simply me, disagree with it. I have bring, the right to disagree. Let me bring you to a terrain which you are more familiar and perhaps <laughs> might have <laughs> exactly. more facts to, uh, which is the aftermath of your convention. That's right. uh, there have been opinions, and I'm going to quote generously from the opinion of one who is still a member of your party and has held position in official capacity. Uh, he wrote an article titled APC Convention the Night After. It's Dr. Dakuko Bitterside. He says the fundamental tenets of democracy, freedom to choose candidates, individual conscience and conviction in dictating the choice of candidates and competition among candidates to demonstrate capacity 
uh, for which they'll get votes in quest for positions, were all sacrificed for the stability of the party. In a process marked by political hostility, and high-wired intrigues, the reign of the oligarchs, and permutations. He likens it to what transpired in the PDP. Now he says we've select, elected, then put selected, uh, party leaders primarily through democratic consensus. We do not know yet the effect of this on our democracy and we cannot predict the impacts accurately for now. Democratic consensus may either be an ingenious system that saved the APC from imploding or a knee-jerk reaction that closed the political space and killed democratic principle of the power of party members to choose their leaders in competitive party elections without interference from any quarter. Well, you are one of those who lost out in this consensus arrangement. Would you say that your party did itself a disservice when it didn't let members test out their popularity? You know, he said it in that right up that you just read. I didn't read it, but what you just read out. Um, there are times when the stability of the party comes first. We are too close to primary election, which is going to happen, what, in May, June at the most? A lot of cynics and naysayers wanted to see the party implode. They thought we couldn't even hold a convention. There were a lot of internal sabotage of people who wanted um, us, the caretaker, you know, to even move on all the way to June and try to do the convention ourselves, to do the primaries ourselves. We resisted that. We forced a convention. The caretaker held its ground that there must be a convention. There are all kinds of intrigues, people going left and right, from within and from without, to try to stop the convention or might by any circumstances possible. In this kind of situations, something's got to give. Political parties are human organizations. Human organizations basically driven by interests that sometimes you may know, sometimes you cannot understand. But the primary interest of most party members is the stability and the cohesiveness of the party going into the primary season, which begins in April which begins next month. We may not, may not have been the ideal situation, but given the circumstances that we're in and the time, it was one of the most realistic things for us to do, to be able to stabilize the party to a certain extent. And I think that we gave in as a result of that. Do you fear That's the consequences it. of that? Or do you think that there could be consequences as a, as a result of that choice? I hope not. As a party man, I hope that the consequences will not be dire or it will not, be, it will not impede our chances going into 2023 elections. I hope not. But do you have those fears? Of course, I do have fears that um, that where I have a fears of the unknown, of I don't know what is going to happen next. Yes, we may have been able to have a stable party going into convention. There were no walkouts, there were no fights. One of the few exceptions I have run, I have conducted three conventions. This is one of the massive ones I have seen, well coordinated in many ways. Uh, so on that, I'm very proud of what we've been able to achieve because I'm one of the architects of the people that did the convention. Uh, but, you know, there's always the fear of the unknown, of what next. The time, the period between the end of the convention and the primary season is so short that, that really anything could go wrong. But I'm hoping and I'm praying and we'll do whatever we can as party members to make sure that, uh, that we weather the storm as well. But it's a fear I have, yes. So I'm sure that while you see the fears, while you, you know, have those fears, you most likely will know where they stem from 
and perhaps what needs to be done to avert it. Some people will say, uh, or they will ask, will your party still be opting for a consensus in the primaries, or will, this, will they be thrown open this time around? You know, I'm a firm believer of contest when it comes to primaries. Let me tell you why I said that. In 2014, when President Muhammad Buhari was contesting, and there were four other people contesting with him, Vice President Atiku Abubakar, Governor Rabi Musa Konkoso, late Dr. Salman Dayazaya, and then Governor Rocha Sokorocha, all contested against him in Lagos. And I remember one of the conversations I had with the governor then, who said, to me that these people should just withdraw so that we don't go into a contest. And I told him no. Now Muhammad Buhari's legitimacy as a candidate would come from winning on the convention floor, not from being given. And I gave him an example, I said in 2003 we were given. Not to given, we, you know, everybody stepped down, we took the ticket. We didn't win the election. 2007, everybody stepped down, we took the ticket. That was in the CPC? In, in AMPP. In 2011, we were in CPC. Nobody even contested against President Mohammed Buhari. We were in CPC then. I was also uh, an MC in that, uh, that, um, in that convention. Mohammed Buhari became the candidate. We went against Jonathan in 2011. We didn't get it. So I told him that, you know what? A lot of people outside just believe that that Muhammad Buhari is a mystery that he is entitled to this position. People just give it to him. So there is no justification when we go to general election. I told him I'm confident that Muhammad Buhari will win these primaries. But I want him to win against these big wigs. So that we win, we come out with the legitimacy of winning. So that the losers would have the humility to work for us. As opposed to saying, if only I had run, I would have defeated him. If only we had run, we would have defeated him. That would have sapped their energy from contributing their quota against an incumbent president, which was then Jonathan. When Muhammad Buhari ended up winning that election on the night of December 11th in 2014 in Lagos, I was one of the people that counted the votes. I was one of the people that handed him over the flag. And then all the contestants came on stage and congratulated him because they lost fair and square. Because if you put all their votes together, it was still not half of the votes that he got. And he made a beautiful speech. He said, I came to this convention without a dime. I don't have Naira to give you. I have my integrity to give you. And you reposed it in me. So going into that election in February, we went with a bank of legitimacy of winning a ticket. Consensus is part of our laws in the party, and the Electoral Act has also allowed it. It is always the safest way, for example, not to go into a contest. But there are times that contest in itself is not a bad thing. Contest and winning gives the winner the legitimacy required to go and face the general public in the general election. It gives you the momentum that primary voters do not give you. That is important. I don't know what's going to happen in May. I don't know what's going to happen in June, if that is when we decide to do a convention for presidential nomination. I don't know what is going to happen. But I do know that there are a lot of people in the party who are interested in the presidency. There will be a lot more people who are interested in the gubernatorial, senatorial, House of Reps. There will be horse trading, there will be trade-offs. There will be times when we will tell some people, that because of this and that, we have to lay go, we have to do consensus here. And there will be those things. Those things would happen. But for the biggest prize, which is the presidency, how we handle it, 
will determine to a large extent how well we will do in one of the longest election se campaign season ever. Because once you become a candidate by June, you have almost eight months of campaign before, to, before the general election. Do you have a candidate? Who, myself? Uh, no, I have an APC candidate in mind. But I am hoping that some of us who are like-minded young people would sit down and very soon agree on a candidate that we want to support based on real conversation with that candidate on how much he's going to look out for the future generation and the country, based on the questions that matter to most to us, which is, we live in a country where we believe that we are materially rich, but nothing suggests so in terms of our budget. Brazil has 300 million people. Its last annual budget at the federal level alone is $659 billion. Nigeria is 200 million plus, just 100 million below Brazil. Our total budget, federal government, state government, local governments put together is less than $100 billion. We can't compete in a global economy with these two things. So the next question for any next month's finance minister or minute of economic advisor or president to us is how do you raise enough money to fund our priorities? Education, security. We talk about all these monies, how much is it really? If you go by the statistics of education, you need $400 to teach a pupil in school a year. The closest state that gets to that is probably Lagos at what, $250 to $300? No, any other state comes even close. The governor of Kebi gave me an example. He said, if I collapse all my budget, all my budget, the whole annual budget into education, it will still not be up to $350 per child in Kebi state. So it's not enough. So the next question for us as young, as well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not talking on behalf of young people, but we have a group, you know, who we are going to sit down and have a conversation between ourselves of what our priorities are and go to the candidate who has expressed or declared interest and have a conversation with him. It is based on that that I, Ismail Ahmed, I'm not acting alone, would be able to say we are going to channel our support to this person. Do you have any fears about voter apathy? Yes. Yes. Do um, you think your party has a role to play in addressing that? Yes. I think the party would have to really, really, really go out and get people to come out and vote. I think voter apathy is real. We can't have 84 million registered voters by any statistics and have what? And be winning elections with 15 million votes. That's so, which means the total number of votes, if you put APC and PDP votes in 2019 together, is less than 30 million. Where are the 50 million other people that are registered? That's, <laughs> that's huge, you know? So which means all the parties combined did not get up to half of the total number of registered voters. And mind you, it's not every eligible voter that registered. These are the only people that registered. 50 million people didn't turn up to vote on that day. So it is real. But I always take an example from what happened in the United States in 2020 during the election between Biden and Trump. Americans, too, never usually go to polls and vote. But because of the pandemic in 2020, you know, there were new laws of people being able to mail, to mail in their votes three months before election day. It turned out 150 million people voted. If it had waited till election day, it would be more than 70 million people that would vote. So which means people are looking for the convenience of voting. If you give them that convenience, they'll vote. Now I'm not saying Nigerians should do electronic voting or they should do mailing voting. Probably we do not have the infrastructures for that yet. But our parties need to begin to think of the best way to get people to vote in the easiest manner possible so that we could get more people to participate in this onerous civic responsibility of choosing leaders in a country where every other thing flows from the decisions of those leaders. It is too important 
an event to be allowed for less than half of the population to decide. Ismail Ahmed, thank you for coming on Heart Copy. Thank you, Mope. That's our program tonight, but do share your thoughts on the connection you draw between the political season and the results we get in governance. They're welcome to the handles showing on your screen. Thank you for watching. I'm Malpa Ogun Yusuf. Good night.